Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight we are in Hebrews chapter 9. And we'll begin talking about Hebrews 9, chapter, chapter 9, verse 1, and down to verse 10 tonight. Which is basically about the earthly sanctuary. And the implications of the earthly sanctuary, what we typically call the tent of meeting or the tabernacle, that place where God met Israel in the wilderness in the tabernacle, when God uh, met Israel at Mount Sinai, and then God at the end of Exodus in chapter 40, God comes down from Mount Sinai and dwells in the tabernacle. Right, the glory of God filled the tabernacle, and God came to dwell in the tabernacle or the tent of meeting where Israel and God met. Um, the writer of Hebrews, or our preacher, is interested in that tabernacle primarily for the spatial considerations, the kind of uh, degrees of separation between God and the people, and how that then uh, connects with or relates to or symbolizes the relationship of our high priest, Jesus the Messiah, and our nearness to God, right? that we'll get to more in chapter 10. So let's start by reading it, and then think about the sanctuaries that are discussed here. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly sanctuary. For a tent was constructed, the first one, in which were the lampstand, the table, and the bread of presence. This is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a tent called the Holy of Holies. In it stood the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which there were a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tablets of the covenants. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things, we cannot speak now in detail. Such preparations have been made. The priests go continually into the first tent to carry out their ritual duties. But only the high priest goes into the second, and he but once a year, and not without taking the blood that he offers for himself and for the sins committed intentionally by the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the sanctuary has not yet been disclosed as long as the first tent is still standing. This is a symbol of the present time during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various baptisms, regulations for the body imposed until the time comes to set things right. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, stopping at verse 10 leaves us kind of in the narrative of Israel. Verse 11 takes us further into what that narrative symbolizes, uh, what it points to, what it bears witness to, that is the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. But I think it's really important that we, that we sit here for a while and think about the significance, uh, the symbolic significance, or the parabolic significance. The word symbol here, translated in my translation, symbol, in verse, um, where is that? Ah, nine. This is a symbol of the present time. What translation do y'all have? Illustration. Illustration. That's not a bad translation. A, a figure. 
Okay, symbol, figure, illustration. It's actually the Greek word that we would usually translate parable. You know, you lay one thing alongside another thing to compare. So it illustrates or it symbolizes. There's a connection. There's a real connection, some kind. So what we when we talk about the earthly sanctuary, we're talking about something that has a real connection with what is to come and what is already is. If you remember, last week we talked about kind of the, the heavenly temple and the earthly temple, particularly chapter 8, verses 1 to 7 or so, and that the question was about where. It's, it's about where the temple is that is the most important, or where the sanctuary is. I use the word temple here, but the, the writer uses a tent, right? Earthly tent or sanctuary. But we're talking about temple in one sense or another. But if remember, the, the heavenly temple is the original temple. And it exists even to the climax of the Messiah. But the earthly sanctuary, which is a part of the first covenant, um, is, the, is symbolic of, bears witness to, the heavenly temple. So when we think about this sanctuary, and I'll just kind of draw it a little bit here. When we think about the earthly sanctuary, it's called a what of the heavenly? Remember what in chapter 8 is called a? Different translations of different words. A copy, a mirror. It imitates a shadow. It's called a shadow as well. Yeah, so a copy, a shadow. I use the word um, uh, analog or replica. You might even think about how the Parthenon here in Nashville is a replica of the one in Athens, Greece. They're not the same, right? But they are, one is a copy of the other. One is an imitation of the other, right? A replica of the other. Um, but they are connected because they look alike. And one is the, the basis of the other. So when we're thinking about the earthly temple or the earthly tabernacle, we are thinking about something that is, uh, I'm going to go this way, a copy. But don't think of copy in a kind of, some people read copy there and they think more in platonic terms, like, this is not really real. It's just a shadow. It's just a copy. You know, in, in Platonism, the real is is not the copy. Um, the shadows in the cave kind of illustration with the with Plato. That that's not the reality. Is something else. The, that's just pointing toward it. But no, the tabernacle is real. It's a real replica of the heavenly world. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind. And this belongs to the first covenant. Remember the contrast last week between the covenant God made with Israel and Judah and how they broke it. And God said, I'll not make, I'll make another covenant. I'll make a new covenant. That's what he said, not another, but a new covenant with you, Israel and Judah. Uh, that is going to be different where something's going to be new about it. It's going to perfect what you didn't have previously. Uh, the first covenant could not perfect. Good and better. Yeah, the good and better kind of thing, exactly. So he goes into some detail here about, in verses 1, uh, you know, if you grew up in church at all, you had those um, childhood Bible classes, you know, a lot of people don't have that memory. That's okay. Um, but some of us grew up in that kind of context. Anybody here build a tabernacle as a kid in their Bible classes? You know, you had teachers who helped you build a tabernacle. Wow, some of y'all just missed out. You know? 
uh, or you had to actually go build one of your own. You know, there is an actual replica of the same size and everything of of the um, of the tabernacle in Leviticus and Exodus. It's in Israel. It's down way down near Elot, way down in the south. It takes you a whole day to get there. That's why a lot of people don't go. You don't want to spend two days traveling when you're in Israel for ten, you know. Uh, so, but they have a whole replica. You can get a, you can look it up on um, on Google. Just look for Timna, T I M N A, Timna Park, and they have some videos that will take. I just spied on Manny starting pee and poop down in the garden. I'm sorry. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. We had some people coming in, so didn't know that. So thank you. Um, but you can look that up on Google, and you can actually kind of get a video walkthrough. Gives you a really nice feel for the size and uh, how actually how sparse the tabernacle actually is when you Good walk. Good doggy, through. Max. See? Good girl, Max. I don't know. Um, so. Think about what was in the tabernacle. Talks about two tents, right? There is the, the first tent. And then the second tent. What's the first tent called? The holy place. All right. And what's in the holy place? The lamp stand, okay, you got your menorah over here. It's like one stand with a menorah, seven candles, seven lamps coming off of the one menorah, one, one stand. And it gives light. There's no light in here. I mean, there's no windows in these tents, right? So this is a dark place unless this is lit. How often is this lit? All the time. Yeah, it's always burning. The priests go in there, make sure it's always burning. It's, it's a, an eternal light, you might say, which represents, what do you think? What, what would that represent, this eternal light? Yeah, God's presence. God is light, right? So God is present, and that light is illuminating the thing that's on the other side here. That's part of its purpose. And what is this on this side? What's over here? The table. All right, so we have a table. And what's on the table? Bread. The bread of presence. So we got bread. The bread of presence. Remember how many loaves? How many loaves of bread? Well, why do we have 12? 12 tribes, right. So the light, the presence of God in the presence of the 12 tribes. And if you remember, the tribes settled around the tabernacle in various camps of by tribe, right? Uh, our preacher doesn't mention it, but there's something else on that table, and usually it's not it's not mentioned very often because it's it's mentioned only in a couple of places in the Hebrew Bible, and not in the place where Moses is describing what to build. But there's something else that's on that table: a drink offering. There's a Something to pour a drink with, a drink offering. So you have bread and drink on that table. Which then sort of gives us the idea of a meal, right? Bread and drink. This is what um, this is what Melchizedek offered Abraham, right? Bread and drink, bread and wine uh, when they encountered each other. So it's a very common metaphor for a meal, for a festival, for sustenance. And probably that's what's going on here as well. That God is um, present with Israel at the table. But the table is lit up with God's presence. And all of Israel is invited to that table. All of Israel is a participant in that table. Except that in this case... Who's the only people who eat this bread? The priests are the only people, right? Because the priests are the only ones who can go in. 
to that holy place. And they go in to eat the bread and replace the bread. You, re you replace the bread every week. So there's a weekly replacing of the bread. And they keep the lights going, right? Making sure it's um, lit up. Uh, you remember what the festival of Hanukkah is about? The Feast of Dedication? It's about the miracle of the lights. That the menorah... Um, the priests could not go in to officiate. They were not allowed. They couldn't go in, and for a period of time, if you can't go in, those, those that oil, those oil lamps are going to burn out. Right? You're going to run out of oil. So, the miracle was that those lights kept burning over weeks, and, and that's the origin of Hanukkah, or the Feast of Dedication. Now, there's one other thing here. Yeah. The, who what? Um, you know, I'm not sure who would break bake the bread. Um, I would have... Would the priests, excluding helpers? I don't know. I'm not sure. Don't know that I've thought about that one. No. There may be an answer to that. I just don't know it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's something else that's now it's a little di disputed. It's a little uh, tricky. Um, we have the menorah, we have the table, we have the bread. And we get the drink as well, in addition to what the preacher says. But then what's, what's sitting right here? Here or here? Yeah, there's an altar. It's an altar. And what kind of altar is it? Yeah, an altar of what? Wooden altar. Oh, yeah, but it's overlaid with gold, right? But and it is wooden. You're right. It's it's, uh, it's golden. It's a golden altar. It's overlaid with gold. Incense, right? Incense. All right. Now we all know what incense is, right? Don't you burn some of that at home sometime or whatever? You've been to Greek Orthodox church or Roman Catholic church or even Anglican church. Sometimes you can smell the incense and. What does incense represent? The aroma. the aroma of God. Okay, this is the smell of God. Now, I think that's true. But it, and there's also another thing it represents. It, in addition to that, that's true. It goes up, right? The incense, the smoke of the incense goes up. Prayers to God, right? So you get the presence of God, the aroma of God, and you have this sense of the people of God praying that the people of God are engaged in, in worship, you might say, particularly prayer. And so the incense would burn, and the priest would go in with the censer, um, taking some coals from the altar, not this altar, there's another altar, and that's out here, it's called the bronze altar, where the blood of the animal is poured out. Not where the animal's sacrificed. An animal's not sacrificed on that altar. At altars where animals would be burned, if it's a burnt offering. But it's also the altar where the blood would be poured out. You killed the animal elsewhere. You killed the animal kind of uh, outside the tabernacle area or at the gate of the tabernacle. Usually it was the worshiper themselves that killed the animal. And then the priest would take the blood and pour it at the altar. Now, there was another thing out here, too, in a circle. Do I remember what that was? Water, a basin of water, where the priest would wash their hands and wash their feet. There was a, not only a basin at the top for hands, but one at the bottom for feet. So you would wash. In other words, before the priests go into the holy place, they have to be washed. They have to be cleaned. And that's symbolic of that cleanliness. And, but they would take a censer and get some hot coals from the uh, burning sacrificial altar. And then they would take it into the tabernacle and they would put those hot coals on the altar of incense. And of course, when incense, start burning incense and get the smell. All of that very symbolic, right? 
It's very sparse. There's not a lot of furniture, not a lot of decor. I mean, the, the tent curtains are, are elaborate. The furniture itself is elaborate. It's gold, right? overlaid with gold. Um, but there's a question here, because, and, and we're not going to have time to talk about this in any detail, but the altar is said to be where, according to Hebrews? Where is the altar? Holy place or holy of holies? Where does it say? It's in the holy of holies. All right. When you read Exodus, it's in the holy place. When you read Kings, it's in the Holy of Holies. <laughs> so there are different traditions about where this thing was located. And even in the time of Jesus, in what is called Second Temple Judaism, we have texts that say it's in the Holy of Holies, and we have other texts that say it's in the Holy Place. So nobody seems to know, you know, uh, exactly, or the tradition didn't survive, however that happened. I don't know. Uh, there's one theory that's pretty technical, but, um, you, you know, we have the Hebrew Bible, uh, the primary manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible that were passed down through the rabbis and the Masoretic text, it's called, because these scribes cared for the text and kept it pure and so on. But when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, it verified that that was a pretty good job they did in keeping the text preserved. Really good job. But there were differences. And the Dead Sea Scrolls reflect some of those differences that may be due to scribal error or miscopying or different traditions of text. Nothing major, per se, but different traditions. And then the Samaritans have a copy of the Torah called the Samaritan Pentateuch. And the Samaritans, um, their text is a little different too. So we have three different traditions. And some believe that our preacher here is using the Samaritan Pentateuch that has supposedly the altar here see it gets real complicated but in other words what when you read this and you read exodus you say oh one of these is wrong you yeah. know but actually it may reflect the kind of um, fluidity that was in the culture itself about this and it may reflect some theory some theorize that maybe the altar on a particular day was moved into the Holy of Holies. And what day is our preacher most concerned about? You don't get that from this our text tonight, but the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. That's the day that he's going to follow through here with. Uh, and Well, in fact, we do get it here in our text because it says the high priest goes into the second once a year. Right. That's in verse 7 of chapter 9. That once a year entry into the most holy, the holiest of holies is Yom Kippur. It's the Day of Atonement. And some think that maybe this was moved inside the Holy of Holies. But we, don't, we really don't know. You know. We can't say with any absolute certainty this is the way it is or that's the way it is. But at least our preacher is portraying it as in the Holy of Holies, probably in order to make his point about Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So what else is in, you remember what's in the second tent, right? What's in the second tent? The, uh, the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant, which is golden as well. Why is all this gold? God commanded it, but why would God command, I want all this in gold? Why, what, what does that represent? What is that telling us? Royalty, yeah. I mean, this is, this is a royal palace. This is the temple. This is where God lives. This is God's palace. So to make that cultural point 
and to impress Israel with the significance of this moment and this uh, furniture and this um, tent. It's a mobile tent, so it's not concrete, right? Or marble or something like that. It's a mobile, so it's a tent. But to impress them with the beauty of God, the royalty of God, and the presence of God, we're going to make this gold overlays. Representing the glory. In fact, we get that language, don't we? Is it... Um, Yeah, the yeah the cherub cherubim of glory of glory, exactly. So you have this ark of the covenant with the uh, with the cherubim, you know the wings over the ark, and what's inside represents the wilderness itself, right? The manna, daily food, represents the um, the authority of Aaron. The budding rod, Aaron, somebody you should listen to. I've chosen him, leadership, and the stone tablets, the tablets of stone of the first covenant. And the cherubim are God's bodyguard, you might say. These are the angels that are represent kind of the bodyguard. Remember, it was the cherubim who were at the Garden of Eden. The cherubim were at the entrance to the garden making sure they were guarding the garden, right? Uh, so think of the cherubim as uh, God's bodyguard. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, what's what's built on the ark itself is actually there, but it's 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 not the real angels, right? It's it's a representation of the angels, right? But in the garden, it was the real angels. Yeah, in the garden, it was the real angels. And at the same time, though it re is a representation, it is also connected to the reality, right? What is going on in the tabernacle isn't a replica that is disconnected from the reality, but it's a replica that is participating in the reality. So the cherubim are really there, too. And God is really there. The Ark of the Covenant is called God's footstool. Imagine God ruling over the world and his throne is in the heavens and the Ark of the Covenant is his footstool. So God is present there as well. So, but it's a good question. So yes and no, you know. No, <clears throat> not those, those, um, those cherubim over the Ark are not the um, real thing, but they are symbolic of the real thing and the real things are there. Because God is there. Yeah. Yeah. Now, all, all that's, um, I mean, we could go a long time on this, right? I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of interest in tabernacle furniture and what it means and what it symbolizes. Uh, and it is important to get a hold of. But the contrast that he wants to draw, because after all, we mentioned it, right? The high priest, only the high priest, goes into the holy of holies. So notice the separations of distance. The priest goes here. Only the high priest goes here. Everybody else is out here. The people can't go in at all. Only the priest can go in. Only a select number of priests can go in. But then only one, the high priest, can go into the... So it's degrees of separation which has several functions. One is to represent the holiness of God. Uh, you know, God is holy. We don't, you just can't walk in, you know, any more than you can walk into my house without knocking. Right? Well, you could, I guess, but it wouldn't be well received. You know? But same thing with God. I mean, there's a holiness thing here. But the degrees of separation is what the Messiah is going to break down. So if you go to chapter 9, verse 6, it talks about the priests going into the first tent, carry out their ritual duties. And the word ritual is the word that we get our word liturgy from. Look at chapter 9, verse 1, regulations of worship. Anybody have a different translation? Chapter 9, verse 1. 
regulations of worship or worship service of worship or worship service or something something like that. It's, it's liturgy. It's what you do in worship. Mm -hmm. So there were things you did in worship. And, and um, for the Levites, talking about the priest going in, taking care of the table, keeping the lamp burning, burning the incense. I mean, they, they had liturgical responsibilities, right? And then when the high priest goes in, he has a liturgical responsibility to put the blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And then there are other liturgical responsibilities that have to do with sacrifice and burning the animals or butchering the animals and eating the animals that are part of sacrificial ritual. There's all sorts of liturgical events that are happening led by the priest. Yeah. But the point seems to be that God has always provided a way to redeem mm -hmm. his creation. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's true. Here is, here, you know, the first tent is providing a means, a means of grace, right? That the people can act on, pursue. Where they are, their life. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, the, the means of redemption. God is always connecting and calling people into that. So Israel has a story of redemption. Exactly. And it's called, man calls it the present age. The present age. Well, it, yeah, this present time or the present age um, is part of our text here. Like in verse 9. Symbol of the present age. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about that present age for a moment. Because what we have with the Messiah is we have this high priest who is officiating in the heavenly temple. And we're going to talk a lot more about that next week as we get through the rest of chapter 9. We're going to detail the Messiah's work in the heavenly temple. But we're told why we need that. Because in verse 9, this... Well, let's begin at verse 8. By this, that is what the liturgy of the tabernacle, let's put it that way, the liturgy of the tabernacle is by what the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the sanctuary has not yet been disclosed as long as the first tent is still standing. Now, the way into the sanctuary, you kind of scratch your head, which sanctuary is he talking about? I think he's probably talking about the heavenly sanctuary there. The way into the real thing, the original thing. In other words, right now we have this earthly tabernacle. And our path into the sanctuary of the earthly tabernacle is, is barred. There's degrees of separation. And only one person can actually go into the Holy of Holies. But it is a symbol. It is a mimicking of what has not yet been disclosed, which he's about to talk about. That is the way into the sanctuary, the way into the heavenly sanctuary. So let me just kind of jump ahead just for a moment. In other words, he's going to talk about a path to participate in this. This is earthly. It's good but it's also less than because it, though it is a means of grace, it cannot perfect or it does not uh, does not perfect. So it's limited. So in verse eight, by this, the Holy spirit, that is the Holy spirit had something to do with this earthly liturgical thing going on indicates that the way into the heavenly sanctuary, which is how I read it, has not yet been disclosed as long as the first tent is still standing, or as long as the status of the first tent. When you think about the first tent being the all in all, 
like if I think about the Jerusalem temple as being, oh, that's it. There's nothing else. You got to have that. If you don't have the temple, you don't have anything. Well, that's putting too much status on the temple because there's an original temple. All right. So what is the way into the original temple? That's, I think, what verse 8 is telling us. So that this is a symbol. This is a symbol of the present, the present where we have access. So watch the language here. This is a symbol of the present time during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worship, but deal only with food and drink. Now, think about what characterizes. We got food, drink. What are the other things there in verse 9, 10? Ceremonial washings. Washings. Actually, it says baptisms is the literal word. Baptisms. Immersion rituals. Regulations imposed on the body until the time is right. So the fullness of this, right? Of which this is symbolic. So would you say that's external and this is internal? I think you can say it that way. External, internal? Oh, eternal. Okay. Yeah, you can talk about temporary, eternal. You can talk about external and perfecting of the conscience. That is external and perfection. The, the function of perfection. Um which includes the fullness of salvation. So it's eternal redemption. We're going to get all that language in the next section, really, about eternal redemption and so on. Um, but let me put it, let me put it another way. Let's talk about let's let's call it the new covenant. Because we have the first covenant here. Now we get the new, the new covenant is um, inaugurated. It's a renewal of the, of the first covenant. It's not a replacement of the first covenant. It's a renewal of the first covenant. But it's a renewal that can perfect. Right? Remember we talked about the, the nature of the new covenant last week. It can perfect the conscience. First covenant can. Sometimes... The way the tabernacle, and I want to call this the church, just for shorthand, but I don't mean church in the sense of anti-Israel or the church instead of Israel. I mean the church as renewed Israel. Renewed Israel, the, the olive tree in which Gentiles are grafted in. So um, it's a little dangerous here to use the word church, because when we hear church, we hear of something, oh, that replaced them. But no, I, that's not what I mean by it. I mean the assembly of God. The assembly of the new covenant. Right? This is an assembly. Israel was an assembly of the first covenant at the tabernacle. We're an assembly of the new covenant grafted into Israel in continuity with Israel. And let me suggest two things here. One is there is a real, um, I think there's, there's value in seeing the connection, a typology between the tabernacle and the church. But that's not what our preacher does. He doesn't draw a typology between the tabernacle and the church. I mean, we can, I think. I think it's legitimate to talk about, okay. I mean, the church has a table, right? And the church has the light of God, the word of God, the presence of God and the assemblies. And we pray to God, in a sense. So, you know, there's there, there are typological ways of associating I think that's a legitimate move, but it's not the move our preacher makes. Our preacher wants to not, not to, um, our preacher wants 
this earthly tabernacle to point here. Not here, but to point here. So that the furniture of heaven is the, like the furniture of the tabernacle. I should put that another way, actually. That the original heavenly temple, that the furniture of the original heavenly temple is mimicked by the furniture of the earthly tabernacle. So, let me just describe the picture in Revelation. In Revelation, we get some of the more extended visions of, of heavenly glory. God on his throne. Right, the lamb next to him. And just think of all the things that we see there. When we, when we go into those visions and we pay attention to the setting and the furniture and the practices, there are seven lamps, seven torches before the throne of God. There's an altar of incense in the throne room of God which are the prayers of the saints, according to Revelation chapter 8, verse 3. I think it's also in chapter 9. You have um, a messianic banquet. In chapter 7, they will hunger and thirst no more. Or even the picture of the new heaven and new earth. You have fruit trees, you have, you have water running, you have the, the water of life, right? And you have the fruit trees that will bear fruit and feed the people. So you have this sense of Eden where food is provided and water is provided. So there's this kind of messianic banquet language as well. You have um, the 12 elders and the other 12 elders representing the tribes of Israel, the patriarchs and the apostles, 12 loaves of bread. Um, you have those saints worshiping, they're kneeling, they're shouting, they're singing, uh, they're singing praises with instruments, with harps. Um, all of that's going on in, in this context too. Because outside this are the, are the Levites who are conducting the Levitical band, you might say. <laughs> the Levitical band is out there praising God and, and celebrating. And, and the people are bowing and kneeling and the people are saying amen. And, but they, they also do that in Revelation. They say amen. So the picture in Revelation is of heaven at worship. With the furniture that we recognize from the tabernacle. But the tabernacle has it, not because the tabernacle invented it, but the tabernacle has it because the tabernacle is a replica of what's there. Yeah, yeah, an imager. That would be another way of saying that, exactly. And so just as we are imagers and we are temples, and imagers. And so that would be part of that, bearing the image of God, right? In the world. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's helpful. Um, and so when we think about the church, what do we do down in that assembly when we get together? When we assemble, what are we doing? We're just doing a social event? Yeah. And where are we worshiping? Together. Yeah, we're up here. Yeah. This, this community has been lifted up into this. We are participating in this. We're not just participating in an earthly sanctuary, but our embodied presence here is not, um, we're not, we're not told, okay, build church buildings and put this furniture in it. That's not what we're told in the New Covenant community, right? God's going to put it on our hearts. We're not told to build a building and put this furniture in it. We are told to draw near to God and enter into the Holy of Holies. We'll be told that in chapter 10, that that's part of what the point is, that God, through the Messiah, through what the Messiah does, 
God is making a way of entrance through the curtain into the Holy of Holies where we participate in the worship of God. And that worship includes bowing and kneeling and standing and praying and singing, singing with instruments even in Revelation, um, and listening, listening to the proclamations of God. You know, listening to the words from God, uh, the book that's in the hand of, of God that the Lamb takes out and begins to open. There's a liturgy of the word. And Jesus is the leading liturgist. He's the high priest who's leading this worship. So when we, we go into our assemblies, sometimes we picture it as, okay, Jesus is the main thing in our assembly. No, no. Jesus is not the main thing. Jesus is the high priest who leads us in worship as brothers and sisters in the worship of the one who's on the throne. Now, does that mean that Jesus gets worshiped too? Yes, of course. And we see that in Revelation 5, that all creation, which means this, this moment is not just us, it's the participation of all creation in this moment. So the pattern, if you're going to talk about a pattern of worship, and what is the pattern of worship for the New Testament? For the church, if you want to use that language, the assembly of new covenant believers, what's the pattern? The pattern is not acts. The pattern is the heavenly worship. That we participate in that. That's the pattern. That's what we are doing. We are participating in that. And whatever that is, that's what the church is supposed to be doing as well. And I would think if we had that on our minds when we went in every Sunday, mm, yeah, it would make it would make the experience. I mean, for everybody, it would be just so different. Yeah, inner, if you're thinking about, you know, we have to be careful that we don't make the building that. But but yeah, I mean, there's a symbolism of our entrance into the assembly, into the community, Manny, we're entering what are you doing into the holiest of holies. Don't you want to come over here and sit with me? Oh, Brother Pat. <laughs> uh, so, yes, no, I'm not going to sit with you, Pat, I'm sorry. Um, but as we enter the assembly, we enter into the holy of holies, and we are surrounded by the angels who are singing the sanctus, holy, holy, holy. We enter that assembly, and in that assembly are not only the angels, but the church all over the world that is gathered and is now part of that assembly. Because wherever you were, you know, on wherever your embodied presence is, when you enter that assembly, you're going here. And so you're there with people in Singapore or, or in wherever, right? Ghana, Africa. But not only them, but you're with those who have gone before, those who have died and are now in the presence of God. And we join them. So we join our grandparents, or we join our sisters, or we join our children, or what, whoever it is that has died before us. And that's we really join them. Huh? That's, what's really going to that's going to church. In fact, that's what it's called in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. You go to church. You draw near the church. Right? And we're going to talk more about that when we get to Hebrews 12. But he's already preparing us for it. So the point is, the church is not the worship of the community, the New Covenant community. The worship of the New Covenant community is not patterned after the synagogue. It's not patterned after something we construct out of the book of Acts. It's patterned after the heavenly temple. Because that's what we are participating in. And... We wouldn't want to say it's patterned after the tabernacle, but the tabernacle and the new covenant assembly are both mimicking the heavenly. And the difference is we have a high priest who went in before us, opened the path for us, was our pioneer, went ahead of us, and has made a way for us to do what Israel could never do. All of us can go into the Holy of Holies. And there's no barrier. We can draw near 
to God. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. Great. Thank Glad you all were here.